Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. So today I will talk about a recent work with uh, Anna Kesselman from Station Q and also Aris Berg from Weissman on information scrambling and Lyapunov behavior in random unitary circuits. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I will first just briefly mention what I mean by information scrambling, as well as introduce some uh, several measures that people use to characterize scrambling in quantum systems. Then I will zoom in to one of the measures, the OTOC, and talk about how to use integrated OTOC to characterize scrambling in spatially extended quantum system. And then I will provide some generic arguments in favor for a conjecture uh, about when Lyapunov behavior in OTOC, when scrambling is supposed to happen in spatially extended system. And then I will talk about random unitary circuits, which we're going to use as a testing ground for, for this conjecture. And I will talk about, uh, introduce several specific circuits that we use, including the special Clifford circuits, the general Clifford circuits, and more generically, just um, random unitary circuits. And I will provide results from both numerical simulation and also the solution of analytic master equation. And finally, if time permits, I will briefly discuss the relation between OTOC and other measures of scrambling. And feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, so first, what I mean by scrambling. Um, scrambling, roughly speaking, is information delocalization. So, Initially, local information after time evolution cannot be recovered by any local measurements. So that process is the information scrambling. And people are interested in information scrambling because it's an important aspect of quantum chaos. That's one of the important reasons. It's not equivalent to quantum chaos, but many quantum chaotic systems have been found to have information scrambling as well. Okay, so there are several ways that people can diagnose information scrambling. Uh, to use OTOC out of time order correlator or to use the state entanglement or, or operator entanglement. So this talk will be focusing on using OTOC to diagnose scrambling. Uh, in the later part of the talk, I will talk about the relation between uh, among the three. Okay, so let's first start by looking at this case that we, you might be very familiar with. It's the scrambling measured by OTOC or local OTOC in a local Hilbert space. So this is the WTV correlator, uh, sorry, commutator square. And in this scrambling system, you expect this OTOC to have early time exponential behavior characterized by the Lyapunov exponent lambda L. And furthermore, you can define so-called scrambling time at which the OTOC reaches a significant value. And the scrambling time in the local Hilbert space case with dimension n scales as log n. Okay, so if your local Hilbert space is large enough, then there will be a long enough time window for this exponential growth, and you will have a well-defined Lyapunov exponent. But for n small, for example, if I have a qubit system, n is two, then you don't have a chance to observe the exponential growth. So there will be no well-defined Lyapunov exponent. So that's the common law for scrambling in a local Hilbert space, measured by this local OTOC. So as condensed matter theorists, what we are interested in um, is that what about systems with spatial structure and lo local interactions? What OTOC should we use to characterize information scrambling in spatially extended system? Okay, so I would like to argue now that we should use instead the integrated OTOC to characterize scrambling in a system with spatial structure and local interaction. So this integrated OTOC is basically the sum of a bunch of local OTOCs. And you may be asking, why can I, cannot I just use the local OTOC? Well, if you just use the local OTOC, what it does is that at the beginning of time, I have Wx located at site x and v located at xj. 
So before the light cone of Wx reaches V, nothing is going to happen and you have zero OTOC. Once the light cone reaches of W reaches V, what you have is exactly the same as the, what happens on the previous slide, that you may have an exponential growth regime if your local Hilbert space is large enough. But uh, I would like to argue that if your even if your local Hilbert space is not large enough, we can still talk about scrambling in this spatially extended system. So this local OTOC here won't be able to capture the scrambling across the system. Um, it will only capture the scrambling within the local Hilbert space. So instead, to characterize scrambling across the space, we need to have integrated OTOC. So I'm basically summing over all the uh, V operators sitting on all the site XJ. Well, not summing over V, but summing over V operators on all the site XJ. Mm -hmm. Could you just remind me, I think you defined it, but what you mean by scrambling is that there exists a well-defined Lyapunov exponent? Yes. Okay. So, just what first mean. of all, I choose to characterize scrambling using OTOC. And then the condition for, uh, is that you have a well-defined Lyapunov exponent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's, you, usually people define scrambling in, for example, SYK model in large N system, local large N system. And there you can define the upper exponent if, the N, if N is large enough. But here I would like to characterize, scram, define scrambling in a um, spatially extended system with where local Hilbert spaces are small. But you do have, um, spatial extension, in, for example, in 1 plus 1D spin chain or unitary circuits. Yeah. Okay. So what this integrated OTOC does is basically counting the number of non-trivial operators in this time evoluted operator WXT. So the picture is that at the beginning of time, I have a local operator W sitting on site X. And after time evolution, it will become more complicated. So there will be complicated structure, spatial structure in this operator like cone. So this OTOC precisely tells you how this local information spreads out in the system. Okay, so in a system that scrambles information, we expect this integrated OTOC to look like this. So this is, so assuming translational symmetry, then fxt should only depend on t. It doesn't care where I put the wx is, okay? So it only depends on time. Um, it should look like that at the beginning of time, you would have exponential growth and then followed by a late time linear regime. So why would it look like this in the information scrambling system? Well, because mm -hmm. At very early time, the exponential growth is within the local Hilbert space. Information spreads, starting to, to spread within the local Hilbert space. But it quickly gets saturated because I have a finite a local Hilbert space. Um, rank, uh, but we are lucky that now more and more degrees of freedom are becoming available because of the light cone structure, because of the spatial extension. And so when more degrees of freedom come into rescue, uh, the system is able to continue this exponential growth. And eventually, when the light cone becomes saturated by the information, the um, integrated OTOC will just be limited by the size of the light cone and behave linearly in time, where VB here is the butterfly velocity. So this is what we expect, roughly speaking, for a system that scrambles information. I, may, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So you have implicitly assumed that degrees of freedom have a finite dimensional Hilbert space individually. Yes. If you have a conventional field theory, that's not the case. Um, that's right. It usually will be infinite dimensional. That's right. And so some of these assumptions don't hold there. Is a... So what we are interested in, yes. So what we're interested in is this case where local Hilbert space is finite dimension. For example, spin chain or right. things like that. Yeah, for CFT, you don't need this integrated OTOC because right. you already have a, for large CCFT, for example, you already have a large local Hilbert space. Okay. Yeah. So, 
uh, to, can I follow that up? So sure. is, there, is there a way of tuning the butterfly velocity? Um, yes, there is. I will mention it later. Because if, if there is, then you could take some sort of a continuum limit where you set the lattice spacing to zero while setting the butterfly velocity to make some continuum speed of light uh, finite. Um, right, but, but then what is the local Hilbert space dimension in that case when you take the continuum limit? It's infinite. It's infinite. Okay. It's infinite. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's, it, you can still use this integrated OTOC in that infinite local Hilbert space case, but I, I don't think it's necessary. Um, this integrated OTOC becomes necessary if you have small dimension of local Hilbert space. To put it differently, if you were to coarse grain over some scale, the degrees of freedom become effectively the Hilbert space, which is for all practical purposes infinite. Mm -hmm. Provide the region over, over which you coarse grain is large enough. So this is related to this question, how you define this continuum limit. So suppose that you have a system which is close to, is an extended system, but close to some critical points to some where you can define the CFT. Right. In this asymptotically, you can define this in terms of some field theory. And so this assumption is probably not necessary in that sense. That Oh, you mean we don't need to actually uh, assume a small local Hilbert space? Yeah, I mean, it's true that if you work in a theory with a, which is a lattice theory, or if you wish a field theory, some, some cutoff, if you wish, then you can probably do that. Yeah. Then you have to look at long at distances which are long enough for this to be true. Mm -hmm. But there is some scale where this becomes true. I think you still need um, to assume some kind of small uh, or, or large. So in the continuum version, the analog of, of this, uh, you know, local Hilbert space dimension would be something like the central charge. And whether it's large or not will help you separate things. And I think Lime is particularly interested in situations where you don't have a large number. Right. It's easier to separate things when you have a large number, but she's interested yeah. in cases where you don't. So it's not necessary to have. Right to introduce this integrated OTOC in the case where you have large local Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. The large dimension already gives you a very large, parametrically long yes. scrambling time before okay. which you can see the exponential growth. Okay. Yeah. Um, but for Emil's question, uh, we haven't considered carefully the, the process of uh, taking the continuum limit. What we are focusing on, what we'll be focusing on is just a random unitary circuits where you have well-defined sites and you can do simulations step by step. So yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we, I, I don't have the answer on top of my head, how to take continuum limit. Yeah. Yeah, you'd probably have to back away from a random unitary circuit because that's like being at infinite temperature. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so right, so what we were at is that, okay, so this is what we expect to see in terms of integrated OTOC in a um, generic spatially extended system with local interaction and, and, and information scrambling. Okay, so we can also, just to be more specific, we can also define this T star, this scrambling time. So we need this T, T star to be, again, parametrically long enough to see this exponential regime. So, and what is T star? Well, T star is basically a result of the competition between the exponential growth originally, initially at the local Hilbert space and um, the fact that more degrees of freedom are becoming available, this expansion of the uh, light cone. So the physical picture is that if your light cone does not expand fast enough, if your butterfly velocity is too small, then the information will quickly saturate, after the information saturates the local Hilbert space, it has nowhere to go. So information does not scramble efficiently in that case. So we need the butterfly velocity to be large enough compared to the Lyapunov exponent so that we can have a well-defined, consistently defined Lyapunov exponent. So the condition for T star to be parametrically long 
for uh, the condition for lambda L to be well defined is that this ratio butterfly velocity of, over lambda L is much larger than one. So A here is the lattice constant. It's, uh, it's needed here to make this thing dimensionless. So this is the condition that we think um, if it is satisfied, then we will be able to observe a long enough exponential region and have a well-defined Lyapunov exponent. I may? Mm -hmm. um, sorry if I missed this, but so are these quantities are related to the local Hilbert space dimension? So yeah. lambda L, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, continue. Yeah, so are you asking if lambda L is related to local Hilbert space dimension? Yeah. It is related, but it's not completely determined by the local Hilbert space dimension. So it will, so it's a, it's like a consistently defined lambda L. Okay, but there's no way to get it from just your local Hilbert space structure. Or... Um, it, it won't. So you will see how lambda L is defined in the example in, of the random unity circuits, as I will show you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. You need some interaction, not just on site, but also with nearest neighbor site interaction to define lambda L. It's still kind of a local thing, but it's not an on site thing. It's not local, local. Yeah, so you, you still have uh, somehow local um, structure to define the lambda L, but then you need a butterfly velocity, a fast, large butterfly velocity, a fast expanding light cone to make more degrees of freedom available to make this lambda L in the integrated OTOC to be well defined, to be consistent. Okay. Yeah. So lambda L depends on your local Hilbert space and also your exactly. local interactions. Exactly. And um, the butterfly velocity depends on what? The butterfly velocity, well, it depends on a lot of different things. Um, but roughly speaking, we can construct a system with only butterfly velocity but without interaction. So VB are you can separate, separately uh, okay yeah i Thanks. think it will become, become more clear when we talk about uh specific examples in the random range circuits. okay thanks yeah so the t star can be defined in the following way so t star is defined when as the time when the average local otoc reaches a significant value so this average local OTOC is the integrated o OTOC divided by the size of the light cone. So if you like, this is the OTOC density. So when this OTOC density reaches significant value, that's where T star is. So similar to the local OTOC story I just told you before. This is equivalent to say that T star is the time scale that separates the ex early exponential regime and later linear regime. And you can solve that T star has this scaling behavior. So it's proportional to one over lambda L times log of this ratio. So here you can see that consistently, if this ratio is large enough, then we will have a parametrically long title for lambda L to be well-defined for, for us to observe the exponential behavior. Okay. So, so the climate? Uh-huh. If I apply this to like the these large M theories, this or the maximally chaotic ones, and lambda is like a, a two pi over beta, so that makes but and then but then so we get our beta over two pi log of something, which is what we usually find for this like uh, saturation of the scrambling time. But then there's no n that shows up because v beta a v b is not there's no n in the um, or is, does n somehow come in with, yeah, where, where does n come in? So, so right. Um, oh, you mean here, if I applied, I don't think you can apply this to SYK because there's no VB in SYK. But, but, okay, well, what about a uh, uh, holographic CFT? We have VB in 2D is just, is just the speed of light, it's one. Right. And, and lambda is uh, two pi over beta. Yeah, I think in that case, you run into the problem of, like, we don't have a local, small local Hilbert space in that case. So maybe this general arguments break down. You have already have an infinite local Hilbert space. So you need to, you need to be careful, reorganize things there. Yeah. 
And it's probably morally the lattice constant times lambda L gives the central, you know, goes to the central charge. You mean this gives the central charge? But lambda L is just uh, is just beta over two pi, right? Right, and A is the UV divergent thing. Mm -hmm. Right. I see. Then, yeah, you probably need to regulate in some way, but I, I think that's kind of where it would. Yeah, I think that goes back to the question of how to take continuum limit. Right. Yeah. yeah. I see. Okay, yes. Thank you. If we are happy just to separate, not think about taking continuum limit, just separate the case of large C or SYK versus this um, spin chain case, then this ratio here, VB over lambda L, plays the role as the N in the SYK case. Yeah, if you, you, if you want. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So this is very generic arguments for any quantum system with spatial structure and local interactions. Um, so what we are going to do next is to test this conjecture in random unitary circuits. So the thing we want to test is that in this limit, in the random unitary circuits, we would hope to see exponential behavior in the integrated OTOC, and also we would hope to see this scaling behavior of the scrambling time. So that's our goal. Okay, so just to give you a quick introduction of random unitary circuits, um, here we're considering the simplest case, one plus one D circuit, uh, qubit circuits. Um, and those are the quantum gates that you can apply in your circuits. So for example, you can have single qubit gates, which are basically rotations on my spin one half on each side. For example, uh, for example, you can have poly X, Y, Z, that's pi rotations, and Hadamard gate or T gates, and etc. You can also have two qubit gates acting on neighboring sites. Uh, we can have swap gates and control not gate, etc. So for now, uh, you don't need to know what exactly those gates are. Uh, I will introduce them later in more details. For now, you only need to know that um, random unitary circuits have been people's favorite one of the favorite systems to study uh, because, well, there are many reasons that people love those systems. One of them is that you can mo uh, model black hole using random unitary circuits and also condensed matter people study random unitary circuits because they tell you, uh, they, they give you insights on non-equilibrium physics. A quick and simple question. Swap is what we normally would call the exchange. Yes, swap is exchange. <laughs> I want to see now in that in that representation. I have two spins. There aren't too many things I can do with two spins. Right. C naught is more complicated than swap. Yeah. Right. I will talk swap about is just, swap is just exchange. Right. Yes. Swap is just exchange. Yeah. Um, so the reason we are choosing random unitary circuits is because it's minimally structured system. It uh, can reflect some of the non-equilibrium properties of Hamiltonian system, although itself is not a Hamiltonian system. It's ran every step I randomly choose those gates, but the hope is that it will tell us something about Hamiltonian dynamics as well. And the practical advantages of using random unitary circuits is that uh, for some cases, the circuits will be easy to simulate on a classical computer. You can get results within polynomial time. Um, another reason is that in some cases, you can derive analytical results in random unitary circuits, as we will show as well. Okay, so I should also mention that we will be primarily focusing on the circuits with two qubit gates only. Um, the reason is the following. For the single qubit case, if you only have single qubit gates, you won't have propagation of information, right? So you don't have this light cone or butterfly velocity. You don't have information scrambling. So we need two qubit gates. So for this reason, we just completely forego the single qubit gates and only have two qubit gates in our um, circuits. OK, so the first type of circuit that I would like to introduce is the special Clifford circuit. Uh, it consists of two types of two qubit gates. The one is the swap gate which is exchange two qubits on the two different sites. Um, in terms of operators, it's exchanging two operators sitting on two different sites. Because we're interested in OTOC, everything should be communicated using the language of operators. Okay, so notice that 
I'm applying the swap gates in alternating fashion. So on even, sorry, odd time steps, the swap gates are applied on odd bonds. And at even, even time steps, the swap gates are applied at even bonds, okay? So this odd, even, odd, even alternating fashion, I would argue that it gives me a butterfly velocity, gives me a light tone structure. Well, because if I start from a local operator here and apply swap gates, it will propagate after one time step to the right, and then it will keep doing that. So this gives you a light cone structure. So alternating swap gates gives you butterfly velocity, roughly speaking. Okay. The second type of gates is the C naught gate, the control knot with probability R. So after a C, a swap, I have a probability of R of applying a C naught on the next time step. Okay. So what does C naught do? Well, C naught has a control bit and a target bit. If the control bit is spin up, then the target bit is unchanged. If the control bit is spin down, then you flip the target state. So that's in terms of state. In terms of operator language, what C0 does is, is the following. So if I have a control bit, sigma, uh, a sigma Z on the control site and identity operator on the target site, then the identity operator will become a sigma Z. That's a particle generation or particle creation process. And if I have a sigma Z on the target, it will be annihilated into an identity operator. So because of this creation and annihilation of operators, C0 is just like an interaction in my circuit. Okay, so this R C0 probability is the interaction strength. It's a tunable parameter in our system. And furthermore, uh, the C0 will determine the C0 probability or the interaction strength will give us the uh, local, uh, the uh, Lyapunov exponent. This uh, is, is kind of the answer to Carolyn's question. So you have some local interaction that gives you, gives rise to the um, Lyapunov exponent. Okay. So, and as I said before, the condition for scrambling to occur for us to see the exponential growth is that VB over lambda L, this ratio is much larger than one. So that means we need lambda L to be very small. That means we need R to be very small. So this is the limit um, where we should see scrambling in, in this specifically designed unitary circuits. So this, is, this limit is basically derived from the conjecture. And we want to see that this is the case, that we do see scrambling in this limit. So here I'm showing the results that, from the numerical simulation. Um, I'm showing two things here. Um, the first is the integrated intense uh, OTOC, and this one, the second is the average local OTOC, the OTOC density. So let's first look at the integrated OTOC as a function of time. This is on a semi-log plot. So recall that we hope uh, for a scrambling system, the integrated OTOC should look like this. It should have exponential behavior at early time. And if you plot this on a semi-log plot, then it's exactly this one. So you see a linear behavior at early time. So good. So the first thing we checked, we do see uh, a long enough, we do see a long enough time window where we, we have this well-defined exponential regime. The second thing we want to check is the scaling of the scrambling time, T star. So recall that T star is defined as this low OTOC density reaching a significant value, and it should scale like this. And this is indeed what we see. So in this plot, I'm, I'm plotting the T star times lambda L versus log of this ratio. And you see that they, those, those points corresponding to different values of R, the, this OTOC, uh, sorry, the C0 uh, density, C0 probability, those points lie on the straight line. So this scaling behavior is verified in, in this circuit. And just to mention a little more on how we determine lambda L and VB, so Lambda uh, VB is basically the butterfly velocity, which is exactly one in this particular circuit, because VB is given by the swap gate 
And swap, what stop, swap does is you move one side after each time step. So VB is exactly one. But for a case, for, for a case that I'm going to mention next, so that next case where uh, you don't have precise ballistic butterfly uh, like constructor, in that case, we can also determine VB by looking at the wave front at late time, how the wave front propagates, and you can fit a linear behavior using that and get the VB. And this Lyapunov exponent, you can fit by looking at this graded OTOC at early time. So you can precisely extract VB and lambda L from, from numerical simulation. And T star is extracted independently. So T star is defined by um, this average local OTOC reaching a significant value. So here we choose the significant value to be half of the saturation value, half of this final late time saturation value. And there's some arbitrariness in here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, those arbitrariness, for example, I can choose one quarter or one third, um, those arbitrariness will come into play as the slope or the intercept. It doesn't change the fact that those dots lie on a straight line. It doesn't change the scaling behavior. Sorry, what determines the value of the Lyapunov exponent in this circle? Uh, basically, C0, the gate, C0 gate probability. How so many? It's tuned by that, essentially. Lambda L is basically R, yeah. Basically. Yeah. And all the dots here have R that is smaller, much smaller than one. So we are in the limit R much smaller than one. Yeah. So this is the numerical results for this very simple, carefully designed gates, consist, uh, circuits consisting only uh, of only C0 and swap gates. So now let's go to a slightly more complicated case, which is very similar to the ballistic case we just mentioned, but with missing swap gates. Okay, so uh, the swap gate here, I assign a probability of having a swap gate at each time step. And this probability is taken to be smaller than one. If it is exactly one, then we go back to the previous case. Can I actually ask a question on the previous slide? Sure. Um, so, so Clifford circuits are very special, right? So, I mean, I guess this is a special Clifford, uh, but um, usually like their averaged OTOC averaged over like the Clifford group will look something scrambling, but if you just take a single realization, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't scramble. Do you know what it looks like if you just look at a single realization instead of? I think in our case, even you look at a single realization of the circuit, it still looks scrambling. It's just more noise. I see. So it, it looks, it does look like this curve just with fluctuations. Yeah. And like, think, are the yeah. fluctuations the, like the same size as the signal, or are they? No, it's it's relatively small fluctuation, and I think the reason is that we're doing integrated. We are looking at integrated OTOC. Okay, that's the difference between. Okay, that's the dip, yeah. So I think the the case you are mentioning is is not integrated OTOC. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah. somehow that fixes that. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Because when you sum over space, you're, you're somehow also doing kind of average thing. And although it's not the average over the circuit configuration, but you're still eliminating some of the bad things, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the second case is called the diffusive case. Well, because I have some missing swap. So why is this diffusive? Be uh, that's because if I start from a local operator here and just apply swap gate. Initially, it travels to the right, but then because of the missing swap here, it will start travel to the left. So this P smaller than one gives you the mechanism for backscattering and diffusion. Okay, so in this diffusive special Clifford circuit, the result basically looks very similar to the ballistic case. So this is the numerical results. Again, I'm plotting the integrated OTOC as a function of time and this averaged local OTOC, this OTOC density as a function of time. And what you see is that, again, you have some linear regime at early time in this semi-locked plot, which corresponds to the exponential regime here. And this T star, again, scales nicely against this log over the ratio. So 
verifying our conjecture. Okay, this is for p equals 0.9. So um, I have not exactly, I have a 90% of chance of having a swap gate, not 100% chance. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the numerical results for this special Clipper circuit, both ballistic and diffusive cases. So next thing I would like to mention is that we can do some analytic derivation in this special Clipper circuit. So as I mentioned, uh, there are two advantage, practical advantages of using random unitary circuits. One is that it's easy to simulate in some cases. The other is that you can derive things analytically. So here I would like to, to give you a flavor of how it works. Okay, so to be more specific, let me take the W and V in my integrated OTOC to be sigma Z and sigma X. I, J here are the site labels. So because we're in the random unitary circuits, energy is not, is not conserved. So we're effectively at infinite temperature. The average, the thermal average goes away. Um, so the physical picture is the following. So originally at time T zero, I'm starting at site I, put a local operator sigma Z at site I, and identity operators on all the other sites. That's my starting operator configuration. And I time evolve this thing. It will have a light constructor and become a more complicated operator string at time T, where outside the light cone, it's still identity operators, but inside light cone, there will be sigma Z or maybe sigma X and et cetera, everywhere, uh, somewhere else there may also be identity operators within the light cone. So it will be a complicated structure, okay? So as I said before, this integrated OTOC counts the number of non-trivial or non-identity operators inside this operator light cone, this operator string. And in our, in our case, because we're applying this special C naught, which is measured under the Z basis, what it does is that it will just turn back and forth between uh, identity operators into sigma z and sigma z into identity operators. So the only non-identity operators in this time evoluted operator string would be sigma z's because I started from sigma z. And after C naught, the only generated operators, non-identity operators would be sigma z's. Okay, so this integrated OTOC would be counting the number of sigma z's in my operator string, in the time evoluted operator. Um, okay. Quick question. Sure. So um, I thought in OTOC you sum over the operators. So it'd be like maybe sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. So um, here it's, yeah, do you not do that for this integrated one? Right, so here we are not doing, we're not summing over the operators. We're fixing the operators, but only summing over the site index. The, so this integrated integration means summing over spatial labels of the second operator. So it would be sigma x, sigma x, sigma x everywhere, and you sum over all the commutators. Okay, oh, so, but for like a general operator W, how do you, like it would be different depending on the operator that you sum over, right? Right, so you can change, in this case, you can look at sigma y, et cetera, but the generic behavior doesn't depend on, doesn't depend on which, op which operators you choose. Of course, you cannot choose sigma z here. This has to be something that's, that does not commute with sigma z. So this sigma z at time t would only consist of sigma z's on sites, sigma z's and identity operators on all the sites. So the only requirement for the operator here is that you don't choose it to be sigma z. You can choose it to be sigma x or sigma y. Is that clear? Um, yeah, I was just like, it seems pretty straightforward in this scenario because all you have are sigma z's, but mm -hmm. yeah. um, in general, like, in general, right. uh, like for a general w uh, x, are in general circuit, then you still, like, wouldn't that be more non-trivial to figure out what you want to take the commutator with? Um, I see. I think that's related to, to a generic question that people have about OTOC. What operators you should use in OTOC? 
um, I think the common sense is that if you just choose uh, local operators, it should it, sh it shouldn't de depend on what exactly local operators you use. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So. So, is there any assumption about conservation laws here? Uh, there's no conservations here. Cons so, there's no hydrodynamic behavior here. Um, yeah. No. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Of course, you you can uh, impose conservation laws and and study late time hydrodynamic behavior. Yeah. But the focus of our work is on early time behavior and scrambling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do is write down the master equation for f, which is how f changes as a function of time. So this df dt is basically, because f is the number of sigma z operators in this operator string, this df dt is the change of the number of sigma z operators in my operator string after a single time step, okay? And this can be further written as the um, difference between two things. The first thing is this NC naught times P creation. So what does this mean? This is the, as NC naught is the number of C naught gates applied within this light hole, okay? And this P creation is the probability of creating an operator is the probability of this process after C naught. So this n times p basically gives you the number of create, created sigma z's within the light cone. Okay, after one time step. So similarly, this n times p annihilation is the number of annihilated sigma z's after one time step because of C naught. And if you subtract one from the other, you get the net number of increase, the net number of uh, sigma z operator, net, net number of change in the sigma z operators in the operator string after one time step. So that's how this DFDT is, can be expressed using those quantity. So that's the basic idea of how this master equation or this rate equation can be written down. And uh, to you, we can be more specific. So it might be a little technical here, but I, uh, let me explain every step. So this NC naught can be further written as this one because this is the light, size of the light cone and R is the probability of having a C naught. So if you multiply them together, you get the number of C naught gates within the light cone. And this P creation, the probability of having a creation process and annihilation process can be written using those two equations, where Q is the probability of having a sigma Z on a single site. Okay, so why, is, why do we have those two expressions? Well, because for example, for the creation process, this is the creation process where identity is turned into sigma z. And the probability for this process to happen is that on this side, I need to have a sigma z, and on the neighboring side, I need to have an identity. And the process, uh, the probability for having a sigma z on a site is q, and for having identity on the site is one minus q. So the probability for this entire process to happen is q times one minus q. Okay, and similarly for the probability for this annihilation process to happen is Q squared. And furthermore, this Q, which is the probability of having a sigma Z on a site is basically this averaged local OTOC. Well, because OTO, this integrated OTOC tells you how, much, how many sigma Z operators there are inside the light cone. And this is the light cone size. So if you divide those two, you get the probability of having a sigma z on a single site within the light cone. Okay, so now if you put everything together and clean up the mess, you will have this master equation. So 
this equation is a first order differential equation of f. And I should warn you that this equation is written down in under some assumptions. So the particular assumption we take is that we have ignored more complicated processes in, in the circuits. For example, I can have a creation of a sigma z and then annihilation between the sigma z and its the and its um, control bit. So a control bit and target bit travel away from each other, but then eventually they meet. So this closed world line case, that's more complicated and we don't include those in those in when writing down the equation. And to justify this, we need this limit. So if R is much smaller than one, if the C naughts are applied in a very sparse way, then it's unlikely that we will have this closed world line um, case, those more complicated case. Okay, so this is the master equation, which is true and only under this limit. And we can solve this equation. This is the solution where EI is the exponential integral, some special function. And G naught is a number that de determines, uh, that is determined by the initial condition. So, and we can analyze the uh, early and late time behavior by expanding this exponential integral in large T and small T. And what you find is that at early time, indeed, it gives me a um, exponential behavior where lambda L is basically R. And at late time, it does approach to the, like, uh, to the linear behavior as well. So this is basically to show you that we can write down analytically the master equation for the integrated OTOC and solve it. And in early time and late time limit, it, it gives consistent results compared to the uh, numerics and also compared to the conjecture that we had at the beginning. Okay, so next I would like to quickly mention just a more generalized case. Um, so what we have been discussing is this carefully designed um, special Clifford gates with only swap and C naught, but I would like to show you that our conjecture also holds in more generic case. So the generic circuits we consider includes a general Clifford circuits and even more general non-Clifford circuits. So let's start from the general Clifford circuits. So the general Clifford circuits has C naught gates whose control and target bits are probed in random basis. So previously in the special Clifford circuit, the control and target bits are probed only in Z axis. But here we choose a random basis for C naught. So it becomes more general. Okay, so when we have this more general C naught gate, the entanglement of state in the circuit will grow. Unlike the previous special Clifford case where the state entanglement does not grow. Okay, um, but the state entanglement growing does not forbid us to simulate this general Clifford circuits on a classical computer because the operator entanglement does not grow. Um, to be more precise, this general Clifford circuits is still a Clifford circuit, meaning that it does not turn polystring into superposition of polystring. So if you start from a polystring operators, um, you can view it as a product state in the operator Hilbert space. And you time evolve it using this generic Clifford circuits. What you get is still a single polystring. You don't get some of polystrings. So you still, it still remains as a product state in the operator Hilbert space. So the operator entanglement does not grow in this general Clifford circuit. So you can simulate it very uh, efficiently on a classical computer. And what we have is this result that looks very similar to the special Clifford case. So again, I'm plotting the average local OTOC. This is the uh, OTOC density, if you want, as a function of time. So you can still define a parametrically long um, T star uh, below, before which you have the exponential regime. Yeah. And now let's go to the non-Clifford circuit case. So non-Clifford circuit is achieved by including a T gate in the general Clifford circuits. 
So T gate is a single qubit gate. It's basically pi over four rotations around the z-axis on the spin. Um, the interesting fact is that T gate combined with C naught gate and swap gates will give you fast growth of operator and state entanglement. Uh, it will turn polystring, just a single polystring, into superposition of polystrings. So that will generate operator entanglement. And, and that's the reason this non clifford circuits generally cannot be simulated on classical computer. Well, you can simulate them, but you, have, you cannot go to very long time. If you want to go to very long time, you have to truncate the bond dimension because operator entanglement keeps growing, so you have to make sacrifice and truncate to go to long time. So we did that simulation as well. So here I'm plotting the integrated OTOC as a function of time for different bond dimension. So solid lines here are corresponding to truncation at different bond dimensions. Uh, so let's first not look at the dash line. Let's only look at the uh, solid lines. So those different bond dimensions will actually give you almost the same result, meaning that um, where you truncate doesn't really matter in terms of the scrambling probability uh, property. And moreover, this dash line here is actually when the T gate probability is zero, when you do not have T gates. So this corresponds to the Clifford circuit case. It's basically this case. So you see that the Clifford circuit case with the non compared to the non Clifford circuit case, again, you cannot tell the difference. Our bond dimension just means for like in like a matrix product state representation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's bond dimension. We're, still, we're still just bond dimension two if we're when we're, we're, we're talking still just qubits. Sorry? We're still just talking about qubits. Though. Yes, yes. But this bond dimension, roughly speaking, is proportional to the operator entanglement. Okay. When you make a cut in when you have a when you treat the operator as a state. You can make a cut and, and, and study the, uh, the entanglement of the operator. And this cut, how many bonds you cut there is the bond dimension. Uh, how many bonds you cut there tells you how many entanglement you have between the two. And this truncation of the bond dimension means to keep the circuit similable on a classical computer, you need, you need to throw away some of the bond. So you're, you need to do to sacrifice. Um, but this is, those solid lines tell you that, oh, it, this um, OTOC in terms of scrambling behavior doesn't really care how many, uh, approx how much approximation you, you are willing to make. And furthermore, it doesn't really care whether you're a Clifford circuit or not. Even if you do have T gate, it, it really looks similar to the case without T gate. Yeah, so those two cases, we, we just checked to see that uh, they gave similar results to compare to the very special Clifford circuit that I showed in the beginning in terms of um, scrambling behavior proved by OTOC. Of course, they are very, very different compared to the special Clifford circuit in terms of entanglement property. But um, since we're only right now focusing on OTOC, they don't look that different. Yeah. Okay, so finally, let me just quickly mention um, the relation between OTOC and other measures of scrambling. Well, I actually measure, mentioned it just now in the previous slide that, um, so we have o integrated OTOC as a measure of scrambling and also state entanglement and operator entanglement. So for state and operator entanglement, roughly speaking, if you see linear growth, then that system is, um, is scrambling. So some people use those as measures of uh, linear growth of state and operator entanglement as measure of, uh, of scrambling. So what I would like to point out here is that, uh, so we tested three circuits, special Clifford, general Clifford, and generic non-Clifford circuit. And we see that in certain limit, when R is much smaller than one, we do have a non-trivial behavior, a Lyapunov behavior of integrated OTOC. However, um, for the state and operator entanglement, they do not seem to correlate with the behavior in the integrated OTOC. For example, in the non-Clifford circuit, the most generic circuit, um, all of them behave non-trivially. But for the general Clifford circuit, 
you do have, when you have uh, non-trivial behavior in integrated OTOC and state incumbent, you do not have non-trivial behavior in the operator entanglement. The operator entanglement in the general Clipper circuit does not grow at all if you start with a product operator. And so in special Clipper circuit, it's even worse. The state incumbent and operator incumbent does not grow at all, while you can still have a non-trivial exponential growth of integrated OTOC. So the reason I'm putting this chart here is to show that um, those three measures or diagnostics of scrambling um, are seemingly catching independent, if uh, well, different, if not independent aspects of scrambling. So I think it's an open question um, of how they are related to each other. Okay, so the final, final thing I want to quickly mention is that the higher dimensional generalization of our conjecture. Um, so what I've been talking about is just one plus one D, um, but we believe our conjecture should hold in higher dimension as well. So in particular, the light cone size in higher dimension is just VVT to the D, okay? So that means in late time, we should expect the integrated OTOC to scale as the light cone size, which is T to the D. And this further gives us a factor, just a prefactor of D in the expression of T star. Okay, so T star has this scaling behavior. It propor it's proportional to log of VB over lambda L, but in higher dimension, in D dimension, you just have a D in front of the expression. So that's our conjecture. It should hold in higher dimension as well, just a difference of, with a difference of factor of D. Okay, so with that, I would like to summarize. Um, so what we discussed today is um, information scrambling measured by OTOC, in particular, integrated OTOC in spatially extended system. So we talked about a general picture of how integrated OTOC should look like um, in a spatially extended system with local interaction and what's the condition for this integrated OTOC to have Lyapunov behavior, Lyapunov regime. So the condition is that the ratio of butterfly velocity over Lyapunov x1 should be much larger than one. In this limit, I can have a parametrically long scrambling time, which allows me to consistently define the Lyapunov exponent in the integrated OTOC. And then we talk about random unitary circuits and specifically uh, the special Clifford circuits, which has swap and C0 gates in both ballistic and diffusive case. Uh, we tested our conjecture in those circuits. I showed you the results from numerics and also the master equation. And we also briefly mentioned the results from more generic circuits. And in the end, I briefly touch upon the topic of um, the relation between OTOC and other measures of scrambling, for example, the state and operator entanglement. So this is still an open question. Um, and also the higher dimensional generalization of our conjecture. So with that, I would like to thank for your attention and take questions. Thanks, Lime. Um, I have a question, but if anyone else can go, wants to go first, please go ahead. I have a question. Uh, I know that in some random unitary circuits, they have something like a phase transition, a geometrical phase transition. Uh, yes. You mean with measurements? Yes. With uh -huh. measurements. Is that equivalent to say that in that regime, the scrambling time is going to infinity or? Uh, first of all, how, so you define scrambling time using OTOC in, in this well, circuit? However, however you define it, okay, so there's a question how you define it. But. Mm -hmm. So there is a question, in, so they look like continuous, like continuous phase transition. Mm -hmm. So the question is what tells that, what's the scale associated with that? Is that the scrambling time going to infinity? Or? Uh, I see. So yeah, we haven't thought about we haven't thought about the uh, circuits with measurement case. But yeah. just for your question, you are asking what tunes if the scrambling time is, Very is large, yes. at those transitions. 
Mm. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. So these are related to this question of the quote, continuum limits and, uh, and how to define it. In that case, you could define a continuum limit. Mm -hmm. Because there's some sort of scaling. Mm -hmm. How do you define, you mean continuum in time? Or in space? I mean, it depends on then whether there's a light count associated with that. That depends on the, you know, the Um, sorry, but I don't understand why it's related to the... Oh, 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 I see. Um, In general, there, you're going to have one of these leave Robinson bounds and they will give you some light cone, right? Right, I see. But but it's... It, are you sure it's related? It's an entanglement transition. It's not the traditional... <laughs> So, but you think it's still there should be a like well, a. I, don't, I mean, as I say, you, yeah. you offer different ways of defining it, <laughs> one with entanglement. But, uh, right. I think it's a very good question. It ties into other questions like yeah. the relation between OTOC and entanglement in those circuits, and also how to take continuum limit. And also, what's the, the nature of this transition? It's, it's not the traditional transition where you can have effectively continuum limit. Yeah. Okay, so this yeah, may be of place. Yeah, that's a good question that I don't have an answer for right now. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, because these Clifford circuits are very integrable um, and still show this integrated um, the off and off behavior, would you expect like a, you know, some some Hamiltonian, some Hamiltonian system that's integrable, like a spin chain. Um, what happened? Like, I mean, both of these systems are integrable. Would you also expect to have some sort of uh, Lyapunov behavior, even though it's an integrable system? I think so. Yeah, I would expect that. You have to carefully design some Hamiltonian system where your butterfly velocity is much larger than some Lyapunov exponent, local Lyapunov exponent. That requires some careful design, but I think you can cook up such Hamiltonian system, which is you not- like throw it into like an XXZ chain, like some integrable spin chain, it's not gonna, it like, you're not gonna satisfy those conditions, you're saying? Yeah, uh, sorry, you're asking if the integrable XXZ chain can satisfy this? Or, uh, yeah, or just like, I don't know these, I don't know these systems that well, but um, I know there's a bunch of just integrable spin chains, right, that if you, yeah. If you calculated this yeah. quantity, would you also expect some Lyapunov behavior? Yes, I would yeah. say so. Yeah. Okay. Not all of them, but I'm sure you can find. Uh, I think, well, I think the, yeah, once you satisfy this condition, then you should have Lyapunov behavior. So it's not really about whether the theory is integrable or chaotic then. That's right. That's why at the beginning I was saying that quantum chaos and scrambling are not probably not exactly the same. Well, both chaos and scrambling measured by OTOC or exponential behavior in OTOC are not exactly the same. Do you consider this study like then a, like a case against the, the Oppenov exponent? Uh, because if it's not related to chaos or? I think, I think so the fact that o, this uh, OTOC does not fully capture chaos is already known, right, by other previous works. So our focus is not actually to strike against OTOC. Yeah, Let's talk about information scrambling. Yeah. Uh, Dang uh, Sure. So um, just going back to the question of um, whether any generic local operator can be used for the, the operators W and V in the OTOC. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't the special Clifford circuit be, in, be a counter example against the claim that any operator could be used? Because it seems that um, it's crucial for there to be a, the app of exponent um, that uh, the C naught gate 
should have a non-trivial action on the local operator W. Right. Um, which means that, which, which is only the case if W is sigma Z. They, if it was sigma X or something else, then the CNR gate wouldn't have any non-trivial action and most presumably you wouldn't observe any of the output of exponents either. Um, right, so in this very special Clipper case, you are right that we need to be careful choosing the W and V because the C naught here is very special. It's the target and control bits are measured, are probed in a Z basis. Right. Yeah, but in the generic case, in this generic Clipper circuits, when the C naught is very general, its control and target bits are probed in random basis, then we, you don't have the worry. I see. So, so, so in, well, that's kind of, that seems like an artificial enforcement of the, the, the idea that any generic W could work because like you're just generally picking your operators in such a way that any operator W could work. Yeah, so, so yeah, maybe I should modify my statement. I think in most cases, you can safely choose just randomly a W, a local operator W, and that would give you the results you want. But in some cases, for example, in the special Clipper circuit, you have to be very careful in choosing what W and V are. I see, I see, I see. Thanks. I don't think there's a very precise statement of like in the, inside the operator Hilbert space, what is the measure of unsafe operators that you should avoid when ca calculating OTOC? I don't, yeah. I'm right, right, right. aware of such precise quantitative criteria. Yeah. I see. Thanks. More questions? Okay, I'll stop the recording, but feel free to stick around. <laughs>